I'm going to pass it over to Mel. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that was a great uh, introduction. Don't uh, put yourself down for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, exactly like Ryan said, um, today is kind of the first of, of a few presentations that are going to come in line. And um, I know one of my colleagues here, Will, is on the line as well as um, and, and Kevin, um, who will be likely uh, stepping in in the next couple of weeks to, to do some of these as well. So um, what we tried to do is build um, uh, a learning plan, essentially, uh, that, that builds on top of each other into different, um, into different aspects of, of canoe and kayak. So um, there's two, two parts to today that I'm going to try and cover, and uh, I know it's going to be a lot of information, so I'll try to get through this um, in the time that we have. <laughs> and um, so the first part is going to be a little bit looking at the characteristics of canoe and kayak athletes. Um, and so here we're going to get into um, just reviewing some of the basic energy system um, and, and developments and why it's so important in canoe kayak um, in terms of some of the training zones that you guys are, are used to and know. Uh, so again, just, just looking a deeper dive into the why behind a lot of this. Um, and then that second part um, is going to touch on um, a timely um, event right now, just in terms of how, um, how we can train some of the different considerations um, to, to look into training uh, with the unknown circumstances right now with COVID. Ren already did a, a nice little introduction there for me, so um, I'll move right into it, um, into the, <laughs> the overview. Like I said, uh, I'm going to start with the energy systems here, look into the characteristics of canoe kayak athletes and then some of the, those metabolic demands. Um, so um, to start off, I'm sure most of you guys have seen this, um, this, this document before, just looking at some of the performance requirements and the KPIs for uh, for that have been identified for canoe kayak. Um, so what I'm going to try and take a look at here is explain a little bit of the why behind some of these KPIs today, um, what they mean to some of the different dif distances, and then um, how they relate back to uh, training them within our, um, our training zones. The following presentations coming up, um, the reason we're starting with this is because the next few we're going to look a little bit into how to monitor um, and how to test some of these um, some of these parameters. So, um, looking forward to that in the next couple of uh, sessions there. So, I'm going to dive right into it. Hopefully, this is uh, some review for you guys. Um, hopefully, it's not too boring for you. I know it's exciting stuff for me, but not for everybody else. So, I'll try to get through this and make it uh, a little bit uh, more exciting and not too too dry for you guys. Um, and relate it to your sport a little bit. So. Um, first, in terms of our energy system, so we have our aerobic and our anaerobic metabolism. Um, our aerobic system we know uh, as our ener energy production with oxygen. Um, so <laughs> if you look at the um, upper corner in that, um, the graph there, um, our, our aerobic system there is, is expressed as our oxidative um, system, so that blue line. Um, so you can see there, this is our, our more slow energy producing um, metabolism or, or um, <coughs> production of energy. And so you can see in that, um, I'm using my fingers here instead of the, <laughs> the cursor. So uh, using um, in, in this graph here, looking at this blue line, um, this is showing here on the bottom here. I know it's cut a bit, but this is your timeline, so 10 seconds. And then on this very far end is your two to three hours points. Um, here looking at in the, in the first few um, seconds, yes, it's being activated, but um, where, where it comes into play for the most part um, it is above that two to three minutes of high intensity work and then um, more so into the um, hour long, so the longer um, moderate to, to low intensity work. Our anaerobic system, known as our, our, we're not using oxygen as much in this system and it's producing lactate. Um, so here you can see in that bottom, um, bottom corner is our glycolysis um, and, and how it breaks down. So if we do not have oxygen, it's not going to go into this, um, this aerobic metabolism. It's going to end up producing lactate um, and um, essentially produce this anaerobic system. So this anaerobic system, if you look up back up to the top, um, is in the green. So here in the first 10 to about 45 seconds, um, you can see it starts to peak around that 45 seconds 
um, um, with max intensity. So it's a uh, quicker, um, one of our, our quicker energy producing um, metabolisms, but not our quickest. Our quickest is our anaerobic alactic system. And so again, this one's with no energy um, avail or available for the system. Um, it's, and it's not using or producing lactic, lactic either. So it's not in this glycolysis system. This is happening um, very quickly within the first um, up to 10 seconds of a very high intensity work. Um, and then it falls very quick as well. So this is our quickest and then goes to, to our slowest with the aerobic. So again, I, I know that's a, a little bit of a, a, an introduction there for, for all of you. Um, oops, sorry, just trying to move things here. Um, so with this, with our energy production, we have a couple different systems within our aerobic and anaerobic and, and how this works. So I just want to break this down a bit because I'm going to go into to a little bit later when I'm looking into some studies as to what it's actually doing when we're um, increasing, how we're increasing our aerobic or anaerobic system. So first we have our, our respiratory system, um, which in, in that system, um, the, the oxygen that we're, we're taking in um, from the air is, bring, uh, is being inspired and goes into our lungs. From there, from the lungs, um, it's transporting oxygen into our um, circulatory system, so um, to the blood. So from the blood into the circulatory system, um, it's carrying the blood out to our heart. And then from our heart, there's a few different things that we're looking at um, in terms of how much blood our body can carry, um, how much blood essentially out to our muscles we can carry. Um, one, it's based on how much blood volume we have, so our, our blood volume, um, our plasma volume um, amount. And um, the second thing involved there is our red blood cells. So how many, um, how many red blood cells we have, which in there, um, another byproduct in there, um, or is our energy, or energy, um, is our uh, oxygen carrying capacity, is our hemoglobin. So the amount of hemoglobin we have available um, is our, our carrying capacity for oxygen out to, um, out to our muscles. Um, moving from here, so um, within that, you have our, our heart's ability to um, pump out blood. So how much blood we're, um, our, our heart is able to pump out and how quickly it is, so our heart rate. So um, it's looking at your cardiac output is what I'm, I'm talking about here is our stroke volume um, times our heart rate is the amount um, we're able to, to pump out to our muscular system. Um, in this, mus in, out now into the muscular system, essentially what we're, um, what's happening is that blood is going into, um, gets sent down to our, our working muscles. Um, so I'm not going to get into too many details of what's happening at this level because there is quite a bit. <laughs> but what I want to just point out is within these muscle fibers, um, we have um, capillaries that are surrounding the muscle muscle fiber. And so the, the higher count or amount of, of capillaries we have to supply that blood um, is going to increase the amount of um, oxygen carrying capacity into those, um, into those muscles and then into what will be our, our mitochondria, which is where our energy is produced inside the muscle. And that's just a, a quick little background in, on um, some of the, the energy producing systems and how it, uh, how it works. But basically uh, more, an increase in our, our capillaries, like I said, is going to be an increase in our blood supply to our muscles, um, an increase in the um, mitochondria, which is where our fuel is being converted um, into, into energy. Just kind of a recap of what I, I just mentioned there. Um, so just a little bit of a deeper dive here into our aerobic metabolism. Uh, so I've already talked a little bit about that oxygen uh, transportation. So um, if we have an, an, an increased in ability to, to transport that oxygen, we're going to have an increased ability to uptake that oxygen um, at the, the level of the, the muscle and then be delivered into the mitochondria. Um, but the other thing here I wanted to, to mention is specific to the sport um, you're working in. So an increase, um, you want to be able to increase the, 
the energy production capabilities at the muscles you're going to be working. So um, thinking, thinking into your sports, canoe, kayak, um, what you guys are, are for the most part, an, um, predominantly an upper body um, type of sport. Um, so trying to still make sure that we're in this time, making sure we're working those, uh, those muscles specific um, to the sport so that we're increasing those, those energy producing um, capabilities there. So our primary, primary source of fuel in this aerobic system is our um, glycogen, so carbs, um, as well as fats. So those are the two, um, two fuels that are being broken down into that, um, into the producing, um, producing energy. I'm sure we've all heard a lot about what VO2 max is. Um, essentially what we're, what we're getting to with this is it's our max ability to uptake, utilize and metabolize that oxygen. So how, um, what's that highest level or maximum ability we can um, use that oxygen um, at exercise? In canoe kayak, so um, we'll get into this a little bit further down into some of the studies we'll look into, but um, for the most part, what we've seen is 60 to 70% of canoe kayak race is spent um, using this aerobic metabolism. So, um, if you take a look at kind of above here in, in your training zones, um, these are the training zones that, um, that impact or affect um, our aerobic metabolism. So your GA1 essentially to your E2 is looking at this, this um, energy system here. Next um, is our anaerobic glycolysis. So again, the primary source of fuel here is the breakdown of that glycogen. Um, so without any, without any oxygen um, available, we're going to be going into um, producing um, the using lactate and breakdown of, through the breakdown of the glycogen. Um, when and where do we use this system um, in a race? So for the most part with canoe kayak, um, we'll be looking at about 20 to 30 percent of the race um, is going to be relied on this system here. Um, sorry, um, so this system here, um, especially at the beginning and at the end of the races, which again I'll show you some um, some of this a little bit later in terms of uh, how we've how um, a, a few studies have actually been able to to monitor this of how much is is needed. And that final system is the ATP uh, CP, so that alactic system. So in your training zones, you would know this as your speed alactic power or alactic capacity and alactic power um, zones. Um, this one here, as we know, no oxygen um, in, in this system. It's very quick in the first 10 seconds max efforts, and then it, uh, it is depleted and needs to be recovered um, for quite a few minutes afterwards. And again, this is... Um, where we would use this system is in any type of sprint situation. So in the, the beginning of a race when we're starting off, so in that first, um, first push and then in the final sprint finish, um, just getting a little bit extra is we're going to be tapping into this system. So do you want to just talk a little bit about lactate as we move forward, especially because in, into the next ones we're going to be talking um, presentations um, about testing and so um, do you want to touch on this a little bit um, of how the lactate works and, and what it is used in terms of fuel? So um, lactate can and does have a bit of a bad rep at times, but um, <coughs> I'll give you a, a few different scenarios as to, to how it can be or why it is given that rep. Um, lactate essentially, as I already alluded to, is um, in this picture down in the, the, the left corner here, so you have your red being your muscle um, sizes where, where things are happening in the muscle. So um, this is where the glycolysis breakdown is happening. Um, but our mitochondria is where, so down here in the blue, our mitochondria is where our aerobic machinery, so that fuel producing, um, energy producing um, metabolism there. But with the anaerobic system, knowing that the glycolysis um, is where the, the breakdown of, of lactate or pr the production of lactate is happening. Mm. Um, we also have this lactate um, shuttling capacity, so the removal of lactate 
um, is happening within this too. So what's happening is we, we break down lactate. We actually use it as fuel. So some of the byproducts of that breakdown, we can use it as fuel. Um, but where it becomes a problem um, and becomes too much is when there's uh, a, an excess amount or an excess production and an inability to uh, metabolize that, that lactate um, in our uh, aerobic system. So um, an excess production of this is going to, um, an excess production and decreased uh, metabolism would indicate an athlete is uh, less aerobically trained and more anaerobically trained, or sorry, not so aerobically or anaerobically trained versus someone with a decreased lactate at the same power outputs would um, show that they, they have um, a reduced ability or production um, of lactate and therefore an increased metabolism and a, a better aerobic, um, aerobic system. So I'm going to show this just kind of in a, in a graph here, which um, is, would be looking at our lactate response in a testing or, or training environment. Um, so two different things here. So our, our, red, our um, blue line um, up here, so that first line is going to be representing a test that happened in December. And then um, the following one here in orange would be after, um, after an intervention of, um, of some sort in terms of training. And so you can see the difference between um, what we're trying to do or what we want to do with training is shift this lactate curve. Um, we want to shift it down and to the right. Okay, so um, we, the bottom half here, so if you look at the left, this is our lactates, lactate numbers down here, and these are our power watts on the bottom. Um, so in this lower range here, so below two millimoles is often where we're going to see that, um, that should say GA1 there. So our, our low intensity aerobic training or recovery is in this GA1. Um, one zones, and then as you as you increase and as the lactate um, production occurs and the accumulation begins, is when you're going to start to get into those longer intervals. Um, it's going to start to accumulate, um, and then where you see the second takeoff, so that second lactate kind of um, accumulation happen. Um, so just up and in and around here. So up here is happening around that four millimole and up is in around those what we would call your your E1. So you're starting to get into that anaerobic, um, uh, the, the aerobic power and or anaerobic um, capacity. Okay, so we're gonna get into now a little bit about the characteristics of, of canoe kayak athletes. Um, so there's actually, if you haven't seen these already or, or taken a look at them, um, I'd suggested that there's two uh, articles down here that I've cited, um, the prediction of, of flat water kayaking performance and the physiological predictors of flat water kayak performance in women. Um, so these two do a really great job of outlining some of the, um, the predictors of, um, of, a, of a race um, and, and some of the, the top athletes. Um, they use national level athletes, um, I believe in the, uh, the flat water kayak, so uh, in that um, in that subject pool, um, and so what they what they took a look at was um, everything from physical to physiological demands um, and testing results um, in the lab as well as on the water, and they compared it to their 500 uh, 500 meter race times. Um, and one of the things they some of the, the key points that they took out of this was that in terms of the physical characteristics, um, as the years have gone on with uh, canoe kayak upper body size and chest circumference, um, the greater the, the better in terms of um, max strength and, and power. Um, so that goes along with this bottom, um, bottom note here on terms of upper body strength and power is, is a pretty big correlate of um, performance, especially in the 500 meter. And then when, in terms of our physiological parameters, um, on the aerobic side, max aerobic power, so the power at which they were um, able to reach um, so their MAP and VO2 max were um, were an indicator, but um, the biggest indication was the um, their anaerobic threshold. So power at anaerobic threshold um, and their 500 meter um, times to completion. 
So I'll show that in a, in a little bit here, but uh, first I just want to show kind of a breakdown of, of the different, um, some of the different durations and uh, distances for the sport. So knowing um, from a 200 to 1,000 meters, um, if we look at the graph on the left here, um, this is showing, I know it's showing in running speeds, but um, what it can, we can break this down into minutes, which is based on um, some of the distances come out. So 30 to 40 seconds, let's say for 200 meters, um, two minutes um, around for the, the 500 and above three to four minutes in the 1,000 meters. So what we're looking at here is in the 200 meters, um, if we're looking at seconds, um, in terms of speeds, we're on the left here, I'm, I probably can't see it uh, very well, but um, these arrows up top here are showing that those um, would be um, your anaerobic metabolism, and then um, the, the arrows on the bottom here are more um, aerobic. So at the, at the top here, you're looking at your, um, your 200 meter, obviously having a, a predominantly um, anaerobic metabolism and then uh, 500 meter it's a bit of a mix here in the middle um, so you're relying on both systems very heavily and then that four meter and above um, is is higher on the aerobic um, but still a mix with some anaerobic as well so back to that um, that study with uh, from David Bishop with the the women uh, flat water kayak performance um, what we're looking at here is they ended up, um, they did a, a anaerobic all out two minute test um, on the, uh, on a, a kayak erg in the lab. Um, and they were able to take a look at um, what point they, what systems were kind of being activated. So essentially in the first, you can see at the bottom here in the white, um, white grayish area is your aerobic. So that oxygen uptake. And then in the, in the black is that, um, oxygen jet deficit, so more that anaerobic, and then the line across that kind of um, separates the two is that peak VO2. And so um, what they're showing here is, is that two meter time, if we're looking at seconds of that uh, two minutes, um, so, so that two meter, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you're looking at um, a high, um, high demand of, of that anaerobic, especially in the first 15 to 30 seconds. Um, of the race, and then our 500 to 1,000 meters, you can see is um, relying quite heavily on that aerobic um, after the 45 seconds. So essentially, up to the 45 seconds, it's a it's an all-out anaerobic, um, highly demanding um, needs, and then from about 45 seconds to the end at 120 seconds, so a full 75 seconds, the athletes were actually competing or or um, using. Um, they're at their uh, VO2 max the entire time for the remainder of the race, or the, the test. You can also see at the very end, um, as I alluded to before, is um, there is a bit of that increase at the, at the end um, on the, the oxygen deficit, deficit um, uh, needs, just based on, um, on the probably a little bit of a sprint finish there. So uh, from, this, from this study as well, they, they took a look at, um, again, the, the, what correlated the most with that 500 meter time. So um, if you take a look at the bottom here, those were the times to completion. Um, and the best times here um, in around that 155, you can see this is on the left um, on that vertical is the anaerobic threshold. So the watts at that anaerobic threshold um, was highly correlated with the, the final time. Um, so essentially here, the, the, what we're trying to show or see is that um, anaerobic threshold VO2 is, is a, a strong predictor, um, being able to work um, for at least that 40, 70, almost 75 seconds at that VO2 peak, um, but also, oops, backwards here, also being able to um, have a higher anaerobic threshold. We're both um, high predictors of that 500 meter time and performance. So just kind of relating this back to 
um, the training zones. Um, so essentially, based on what we know from um, the, the performance and the, the key performance indicators being, being some of those, um, that aerobic and anaerobic threshold in VO2 max, um, our programs should, um, our programs need to, to relate to that or, or represent that as well. Um, <laughs> so um, being that the, the sport is predominantly 60 to 70% um, aerobic, this is where we're looking at in here is that um, GA1 to E to E2. Um, and then speed endurance speed in and around this um, zone five, six here. So we're just gonna touch on this bit. I'm not gonna get too much into to how, how to periodize um, over the year, but just wanna touch on it a little bit here. Um, again, just another view at the, the training zones from um, CKC. So, um, here, usually we want to be able to, uh, um, based on some of those KPIs, you want to be um, training throughout the year a lot of these, a lot of different components and systems. Um, usually at the beginning of our season, so in that general prep type of phase is where we're going to be um, training more so that aerobic uh, capacity work, so that long, uh, long endurance and NVO2. Um, into the, the winter months, which is kind of what we're just coming off of now, would have normally been um, in a traditional periodization setting, um, working in and around that, that high kind of MAP, critical speed, and, and starting to work into that, our anaerobic. And then into competition season is where we start to look at um, including a bit more speed type of work. Reason behind some of that is just looking at our training residuals. So training residuals meaning um, in terms of detraining, if we were to stop or um, completion of, of training, um, how quickly do these different systems um, detrain? And so our aerobic endurance, it does take longer to build up, but it also takes a little bit longer to um, fully detrain. And same with our max strength and um, anaerobic endurance. So. Um, as you go along here, you can see that max speed being, yes, it, it actually, um, if we were to stop training max speed, it's going to go very quickly um, in what we have here, five to five to 10 days. So that's kind of uh, the reason behind some of, some of the, the, the programming here or why we might um, train different systems at different times closer to competition versus earlier in the year. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, later into our next um, presentations, we'll, we'll take some of this information um, we've covered right now um, into this and, and move it into a little bit more details into how we're going to monitor and test some of those, um, those parameters and KPIs mentioned. All right, so hopefully that was a fun little review for you guys in terms of physiology and just energy systems in general. Um, and I'm just going to get into a little bit about what now in terms of what's happening and where our training can be at the moment and um, a little bit about uh, some, some detraining effects and what we can do to, to minimize um, as much as we can right now. So I'm just going to throw up two, um, two really good reviews and articles here by, um, by uh, uh, a researcher named Inigo Mojica and probably his name just a little bit. He's a researcher from Spain, um, but he, he does quite a bit in, in a, a lot of different areas and, and did some, some really good reviews here on detraining or, or loss of uh, physiological adaptations from detraining. Um, so there's short-term and then long-term detraining effects. Um, short-term is in around the four weeks um, and then above four weeks is, is when we're getting into a little bit long-term long -term effects. Um, so here in a, in a short term period, so if we were to stop um, training altogether and um, up to that four week point, um, some of the different training characteristics, um, again, that I mentioned earlier on in, in how we uh, develop our, our systems um, are being affected. So we'd, we'd see a decrease in max oxygen uptake. We'd see a decrease in that blood volume in our heart rates um, and, and stroke volume. Um, so overall, that, that cardiac output is going to be decreased. Um, oxygen 
and a decrease um, eventually in, in endurance performance. If we take a look um, at this in terms of timeline, so this is actually looking at um, a review on heat acclimation, but if we take a look at this, it actually um, touches on, um, it's a good visual to see some of these adaptations and, and how quick they can go within the first couple of days. Um, so the main ones we'd be looking at in this would be plasma volume, heart rate, and exercise capacity. So the blue, red, and, and green here on this graph. Normally, we'd be looking at it from left to right, but um, in terms of detraining, we're looking at it from right to left. So if you take a look at that heart rate, for example, um, we'd be able to maintain it, maintain it, and then all of a sudden around that day seven to 10, we'll like, we would start to, to have a decrease um, in, that, in that heart rate or an increase in that heart rate, sorry. Uh, plasma volume um, and exercise capacity, similarly, um, in those first few days, we can maintain for the most part and then around that seven to 10 um, and eventually around that 14 day mark, we would see a, a pretty big decline in the exercise capacity and plasma volume. If, Again, if, if there was a detraining and, and very limited de, um, training um, being happening. I already touched on this, just on the training residuals. So same piece goes here with this is um, in terms of what, uh, what systems go, go quicker than others and um, in terms of strength and, and aerobic. Um, I just want to touch on a, uh, a study here actually done in uh, canoe kayak athletes. Um, so there's very few um, papers or studies out there on um, with elite athletes and detraining, and mostly because um, to get a, an elite athlete to, to completely um, buy into to either reduce training or no training at all is extremely difficult. So they did do, there is one here on... Um, where they took 14 world-class kayakers after world championships. Um, again, I, I'd really suggest you guys go take a look at this, um, this review. It's, it's really well done in how they, um, they, they show uh, what they did in this pre-phase, in this 43 phase um, beforehand and, and in the weeks of, of the taper phase. Um, but what the study was looking at is after that world championships, um, they did a five-week detraining. So they separated the, the 14 athletes into two groups, one had um, reduced training, one had um, fully, fully cessation of training. Um, and in that reduced training group, um, what they did is they essentially broke it down to only one resistance training um, a week and two endurance training sessions a week, which is, um, is as you all know, quite, quite small and limited there. Um, so in the, in the resistance training, they really looked at only doing some max um, training, so more um, strength endurance there, and then endurance training was two by 40 minute moderate intensity. So even the, even the intensity was quite low in the endurance training. What they found with that uh, was that they were, um, as you would expect, um, in, the, in the control group who did complete cessation, they actually had a pretty big decrease of a, or, or a normal decrease that you would expect at about 11, usually 10 to 10 to 11 percent um, decrease there in their VO2 um, capacity, and then in the in the reduced training group, they had about a 5.6 percent, almost 6 percent um, decrease. So almost half um, compared to the to the fully um, cessation group. So the point here really is that um, yes, there's still a decrease in that um, reduced training group but the, the reduction was a lot smaller um, than fully, fully um, reducing or fully, fully completely uh, cessation of training, um, but also taking a look at how many sessions you need to do um, to even just have a, a 5%, um, it's pretty low, which is actually really positive to see that only a 40 minute moderate intensity exercise, you can maintain these elite athletes um, with prior obviously um, training um, have a pretty small decrease of only 5% um, because um, what I didn't mention earlier was in those, as much as we might see um, some of those decreases happen um, within the first kind of 10 days, um, with prior training experience, especially at that elite level, 
um, you would see within the next, within five to 10 days, you should and would be able to uh, increase these numbers back up to, to normal. So just as much as we um, decrease um, at, with reduced training, with prior experience, we would increase our, our ability to, to train um, and our VO2 numbers as well. Similarly with the, the strength numbers here, so um, <laughs> the bench press and the bench pull, um, we see a, um, there was a, a decrease from 8.9% to 3.9% um, between the two groups. So again, almost half um, with the, with the um, reduced training group, uh, which again was really only one, one resistance session a week at some max. So, so that's still pretty, pretty good. And similarly with the, the bench pull. Uh, one of the final things here that I wanted to touch on in terms of training interference um, is just concurrent training and, and understanding your sport. So knowing that our, um, with canoe kayak, where um, you do want if um, there is a pretty high uh, strength and power component to the sport, so you want to be uh, maintaining, increasing some of those um, uh, some of those adaptations um, now and and through this um, is keeping in mind how endurance training and or how resistance training affects each other. Um, so we know that resistance training doesn't affect endurance training as much. Um, however, our endurance training can negatively impact um, our resistance training, right? So um, this review here is looking at um, how, um, how our aerobic training again can impact that. And so um, even by doing one to one to four days of aerobic training uh, a week um, can impact our hypertrophy strength and power here. So there's a pretty big decrease. Um, the, the more aerobic sessions you do within, within a week are gonna impact that strength and, and power work. So just keeping that in mind as you, as you go through and what you're trying to focus on um, one during this time, but also um, throughout the season. I'm gonna cover this just Quickly, um, by no means, um, I know Kevin's on the line here too, and this is more his area, but just wanted to, to give a little bit of information here on how we can maintain some of these strength, um, strength adaptations. So right now I know we, um, some athletes might not be fortunate enough to have um, heavy weights at home. Um, so a way we can play around with that is by um, playing with our, our volume and frequency. Um, with some body weight exercise or using different different things at home to, to uh, make some weights. Um, but we can also keep up some of our speed strength um, by playing around with some jump training and, and different speed work. Um, and in terms of max strength, it might be, it, it will be a little bit harder to do this um, if there's no weights involved, but another way we can um, at least play, play around with keeping and maintaining some max strength is with some isometric training. Um, which can, I don't think I put the reviews on here, but there are some pretty good isometric training uh, um, studies done in and around this. Um, lighter weights, but going to failure. So um, again, with that volume and frequency, so increasing the volume um, of what you're doing um, if there's no weights available. Um, two to three sessions. Again, if, they, if you're gonna do less sessions, increasing the volumes in the sessions you are doing. Um, and then um, increasing our power is possible, just bearing your loads and using different, uh, different ways to do that between strength or jump training and, and different stuff like that. Um, but with those sessions, making sure you have a high, um, high focus and, and quality work in there is gonna increase that, uh, that ability to um, improve our power. So just to wrap it up, um, now I just kinda wanna go through what this means um, and some of the different things um, in and around our, our programming right now. So um, first off looking, um, what we just kind of did earlier in the presentation was reviewing our individual and sport, uh, sport gap analysis or what our KPIs are for the sport. Um, and, and, and always going back to what those first principles are. So um, next up would be, um, actually Will will be speaking on this next week, but what are our athletes' biomechanical deficiencies? So is there anything we can do at this time to work on, on these areas that we may not have been able to, to prior? 
Um, and and some, so some of those things might be just coming down to um, functional movement or different injury patterns and stuff that, that have been going on. So maybe at the beginning of these, um, this eight week lockdown, um, that, that's where kind of our focus um, could and, and, and should be just in, in helping um, athletes stay, stay focused through this time. And then looking at athletes' uh, lifestyle gaps. So are there any basics that they need to kind of return and look at? So how's their sleep, their nutrition, um, mental health, mental performance, those types of things um, during this time. So um, really taking a hard look at uh, both the athletes and, and us as coaches, um, taking a look at our, our lifestyle gaps and, and making some changes while we can during this time. Uh, finally, coming to resetting our plans. Um, there's obviously a lot of TBDs at the moment and not really knowing. Uh, for what uh, Ryan has told me, I know um, in Ontario, we're not quite sure on when or if things are going to be fully canceled for the summer or if um, there's going to be still events happening. So with those unknowns, I know it, it takes a toll on, on not understanding how or when to program things. Uh, so what we want to do and focus on is just what we do know. And so if if we still have if there's still a potential opportunity to be training um, or competing later this summer um, then it is a matter of trying to um, try to maintain what we can during this time um, with the athletes so whatever the athletes have available to them um, trying to focus on those areas and um, not get too ahead or stressed at the fact that you might need to be in full competition mode by july august or, or um, september whatever it might be um, so reset your plan, work backwards from those plans a little bit if you need to. So um, just take it kind of month by month right now versus taking an, an overall look at, uh, at the next year like we normally are used to doing in our training plans. Um, setting specific goals um, that we can all, that um, everyone can achieve. So design the plan to one, keep our immune health um, in check. Um, and having things still be fun and motivating back home um, for the athletes and trying to keep as much sports specificity as possible. So as I mentioned earlier, just in around um, trying to get as much upper body or um, work as possible as well in, in how we're training our, um, training our different systems because um, it will help with the, the adaptations for when we do, when you do get back onto the water. I stay the course, but also review the plan um, all the time. So again, every day things are changing. So continuing to review that plan with the athletes, what, um, what they can work on, what they have access to. So again, just taking a look back to what we reviewed earlier with our, um, with the training plans or, or periodization of this, um, things might change. So this is, this is, would be the, the traditional method or traditional way of looking at our training zones and, and how we're going to, um, how we're going to work through them throughout the season. But without this competition phase as a big question mark or unknown, um, we might have to, to look back and just understand what, when we do get back on the water, um, what are we going to want to work on the most? And so if for some of you guys working with younger athletes or, um, athletes who haven't been in the sport that long, if you think you're going to be wanting to uh, need to do a lot of technical tactical work, um, you're going to be probably doing a lot of this kind of lower intensity work with them um, to be able to work on that technical tactical stuff. And um, knowing everyone's going to want to have um, a lot of volume on the water to, to be able to work with the athletes, um, keeping in mind what those, what that progression looks like um, and try to, um, try to keep in mind or, or take a look at what energy systems we can get a head start on now, uh, working towards, and then what you're gonna wanna work on when you get on the water. Um, because um, as, you, as you saw, um, and as you probably know, canoe kayak is a very energy system um, heavy sport, and um, there's a lot of technical tactical components to it. Um, but if you can nail down some of these, um, some of these, uh, systems ahead of time before you get on water, you'll be in a pretty good spot um, to be able to still compete um, if that is going to be what happens later in the season or in the summer and, and fall. 
final thing I would kind of want to leave you guys with in terms of when you do get back on the water with that is um, keeping in mind that progression and monitoring and knowing that um, if the athletes haven't been doing um, a skill or a movement that they um, are normally used to, um, just keep in mind some potential injuries that could come about from, um, from not having done or from doing too much of uh, one activity. So if they're not used to running and they're doing a lot of running right now, keeping that in mind um, during this time, but also when they get back in the boat, if they haven't been doing um, any type of paddling motion to, to keep that progression nice and slow and not to, to push it too soon. Um, I know a lot of our, our thoughts are going to be, we want to get them um, back to the sports specific environment and um, push them as much as we can. So just keeping in mind to, to not push things too much too soon. Awesome. I think that, that's all I got from my end. Um, I haven't had a look at the, the chat box yet. So Ryan, if you wanted to, to pop yeah, on Yeah, I don't. Here. Thanks, Mel. I, I don't think we have any in the chat box right now. So I, I'm just going to open it up to if people have questions and they, they can un unmic themselves. Perfect. Sure, I got one. Can you hear me? Yep. OK. Hi, Mel. Thank you. Um, maybe I should. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to see me or not. But. Yeah. yeah see anyway, you. is it on? Yeah. Doesn't matter. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so the the Bishop paper on the uh, one of the key findings was was the speed and power and anaerobic threshold um, mm -hmm. is correlative to performance, right? Um, so does it say anything about how we should train for that? Is it suggesting uh, that, that we do most of our training at the threshold or yeah, so I mean, if we, if we look back to that paper, it doesn't talk too much about how to train that. It's more just on the performance side of things. But if we're if we're talking about how to train that, um, I think there's a few things to keep in mind. If we look back at the physiology of things, is yes, we need to um, spend a lot of time in uh, developing that anaerobic system or that uh, being able to sustain that peak VO2. Um, but you're not able to really get to that point if you don't have the um, increased mitochondria ability or the increased capillary um, numbers either. So um, those those small those kind of physiological adaptations that you need usually happen at the um, the lower intensities and the um, aerobic um, side of things. So having that that background or that um, those adaptations on the aerobic side will build you up and then. Um, and then spending time on the on the anaerobic system. Okay, great, thanks. Now I've seen that paper before, but never been able to like access it or download it. I don't know if that's something you're able to to share with us or uh, right and, and and the other stuff too, if they're linkable or anything like that. Yeah, maybe what I'll uh, do, I'll I'll send it out to Ryan and okay, um, is that okay. how accessible it is, but. Um, I'm happy to share that at least. Okay. Before. And then the other little question is just around the, the residuals. Are, are those from Vladimir Isserin? Those, uh, so there's, so just his, are there any other sources of that or is it just him? Uh, the one I pulled up was from him. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of research in that area, but there didn't used to be, he seemed to be the only source of that, but. He's still pretty leading in that, in that area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's it. I'll take my mug out of here. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Any other questions for Mel? You got a silent group here, Ryan. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> if you do have questions, Mel, Mel's email is there. Um, or, or you can direct them to me if you prefer, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of catalog them and, and pass them off to Mel. Rob, do you have any? Do you have any oh, I was <laughs> just playing with my buttons. Um, no, I was gonna, I was gonna ask. Uh, did, I, I was a couple of minutes late. Did, did Mel give a background on herself? Like, is she? So when I checked her yesterday, she was the last thing she was in BC. So she, like, <laughs> she, is she like here now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I do work at uh, CSI Ontario. Okay. I've been working with Ryan for the last. Uh, year and a half almost um, okay group in the Ontario group so but you, you were at uh, Pacific before 
Yeah, I was at Pacific for, I guess, almost eight years before that. Okay. Um, and then just been at CSI Ontario for, just, yeah, just over a year and a half. Okay. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. I, um, I asked Mel to try and give us a physiology first year undergrad 101 course in, in 20 minutes. So um, <laughs> I think she did an amazing job and in, in how that relates to our sport. Probably saved us a lot of time and money. So I really appreciate it, Mel. Uh, as I say, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to Mel or myself. Um, next week's going to be a little bit different. We're going to do two sides. So uh, we're going to have a, a live session at 2 o'clock on Thursday, and it's going to be with um, Olympian Brady Reader, Reader, excuse me, sorry, Brady, and uh, Chris Mihak. And they're going to talk about uh, uh, Brady's drive to the Olympics in K4 in that experience. Uh, but we'll also, uh, Will George from the center, excuse me, the Institute, will um, be producing some background information on biomechanics. Um, that won't be a presentation, a live presentation. I'll just uh, send that out to, to all the coaches. And that will help us for our, our next um, uh, uh, sports science uh, provider, which will be Mel and Will, a live presentation on the, the following Thursday, the 21st. So next week, we're working with the athlete side. And then the week after that, we're back with the, the scientists. So I appreciate everyone that joined us. We, we are recording it. So uh, and we'll put it on our, our uh, website and YouTube page that if you want any of the athletes to, to watch it, that'd be great. So thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Mel. I really appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone.